Brambro back with some Grand Tactician Civil War. We've got a CSA campaign going here in version 1.06, which is the current live version of the game. And we're into March 1862, which is technically still winter weather, but winter is fast coming to a close. And it's been a fairly eventful weather, any, uh, weather, winter anyway. Uh, we've had quite a few battles over the winter. <clears throat> I don't have a tremendous amount to talk about with regard to uh, recent comments. Uh, there have been tons of them, and I really appreciate the engagement. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the comments on, on the videos. That's really good to see. Um, but if I talk about all of them, you know, <laughs> that eats up a lot of time in the episode. And, uh, you know... I, I don't respond to every single comment, but I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think I res respond at some length sometimes to uh, most of them. At any rate, I really appreciate all the comments, and, uh, as, you know, every once in a while I'll, I'll still address one, but uh, I don't want that to eat up too much time. I do have a couple of things I do want to talk about. Um... First, it has come up a couple of times in this campaign about, you know, we had all these tiny brigades in these forts over in the Indian Territory, and these are mostly Texas brigades. There's six forts here. Five of them are in the Indian Territory. They have Texas had. They've moved now, but they start with Texas brigades. And then there's Fort Smith, which starts with an Arkansas brigade. So five Texas and one Arkansas brigade. And they start very, very small. You really can't do anything with them. And I have, and I had, knowing they were there though, I just let them stay there under the idea that they would slowly grow. The key term being slowly. That's not really the right way to go about it. And then someone had the idea, well, maybe they'll grow faster if you move them over and put them under brag over here. Just because they're in an army, not sitting out in a fort in the middle of nowhere, maybe they'll grow faster. That was a good idea, and I did that. And that's where those brigades are now, in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, that wasn't really the way to do it either. <laughs> There is a mechanic in this game, which I've known is there, but I keep forgetting about it, and I haven't used it before. So, um, earlier today, I ran a little test campaign to try a few different things out that I didn't want on camera, kind of in real time, just so I could speed through it 50x. Um, and what I've discovered is that... Let's bring these guys up. This thing right here, Replenish Unit. This thing is pretty powerful. <laughs> um, but what this does is it temporarily makes the brigade, the unit, unusable. It doesn't send it out of the army organization. But this unit will gray out because you've sent them home to kind of rest up and get more guys. Well, it it does a lot of guys. And uh, the closer they are to their home state, the quicker they come back to the army. It, it's like a... a, a it varies from anywhere from one to two months, which if you don't have an immediate need for those troops, which we don't for these guys, that's a pretty reasonable amount of time. It's not that much more than simply recruiting a new unit. So I think what I should have done, dumb, done was either A, leave them in these forts, because they're pretty close to Texas, or just go ahead and organize that army w while they're still tiny and put it, you know, 
put it like at Dallas or something like that, and then and then replenish them all. I keep wanting to use the term furlough, although that's not really the right term. It, the mechanic is replenish unit. And uh, instead of watching them trickle in a few dozen at a time over months, uh, one replenishment seems to about triple the size of the unit. You know, they're 600 when you send them out, and when they come back a month later, they're like 1,800. Do that twice, and boom, you've got a real uh, core of full-size brigades it, it's really kind of a way of jump-starting, kind of juicing that manpower replacement mechanic. Now, you do need the manpower available, right? If there's zero manpower available in Texas, well, then they're not going to replenish. So you do have to double-check that and make sure that there's enough uh, folks there. So this has kind of made me rethink what's really the best way to recruit troops in this game. Because, you know, when I first started playing, I did what probably most new players do. I just simply recruited directly into the armies. And then they would show up and however long it would be, not paying attention to what state they came from. And when you do that, though, that reduces the readiness of the army. Because, you know, if if this commander in his army, let's say he's got six infantry brigades, he's got them all there under his command available for use. <clears throat> he's got green readiness as a result. And then you go recruit three more brigades. Okay, he's still got those six brigades. However, now his total force is nine brigades, three of whom aren't there. And that degrades readiness. And that's why quite some time ago I started using kind of separate rear area recruiting commands. And, and, I, and a lot of players do this as well. The idea is recruit them here and then send them forward. Because the transfer... Uh, troops transfer between armies pretty quickly in this game. A lot faster than you can recruit them. And that might still trash readiness a little bit but it's it's only for a few days instead of for like a month and that's what I'm doing here I've got this uh, recruiting command and, and I kind of put it here in the middle of the Confederacy now what I think the thing to do is multiple recruiting commands Maybe even state by state, there's a North Carolina recruiting command, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, you get the idea. Maybe not quite that far, but you know, have one just for North Carolina and Virginia, one just for South Carolina and Georgia, one maybe kind of up here around Decatur for Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama. And one over here, something like Shreveport, Little Rock, for the Trans-Mississippi. The idea being, you recruit the brigades, they show up faster, because they're coming a shorter distance to that point, and then you recruit small brigades, 1,500 men infantry brigades. They get there, And then you equip them with whatever rifle that you want them to have. Then you furlough them, or excuse me, replenish them. And now they're out for another month. But then they come back, and now you've got a full-size brigade. Or at any rate, a much, much larger brigade that is well equipped you've got the Mississippi rifles or the Springfield rifles or the infields or whatever you know kind of standard infantry arm you're using and that helps manage the number of weapons you have to order 
y'all see where I'm going with this? I, I think that's what I'm going to try doing in my next campaign. I'm going to run that a little differently and just see how that works out. Now, if you need men really, really fast right now in a particular area, yeah, you got to do something else, you know, but just kind of the slow building the army over time process, I, I think I think that's uh, something that I hadn't thought about before that I'm going to try in a future campaign. And maybe even for the, well, and kind of for the, the rest of this one, because while... Uh, Let's just see how these guys... Now, these guys actually have Springfield Rivals here. But these others, I didn't have anything else. They still have Springfield Muskets. So I'm not going to replenish them just yet. What I'm going to do is I am going to wait for... Da, 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 da. In four days, we're going to have 50,000 Mississippi Rifles. I'm going to equip all those brigades with these. Then I'm going to send them back to Texas to replenish. Yeah. And what that's going to do is that's going to give... That's going to give us... You know, I've been talking about... I want another core up here for Sidney Johnston. Army of, the Tennis, uh, Army of Tennessee. That, and that's where that core is going to come from. Yeah, I know. Had the idea about we want to send them out here. We want to mess around in Kansas, do some raiding. Uh, I haven't completely abandoned that idea. But that's what I'm going to do with these particular infantry brigades. Anyway, so... The short version of all that is, hey, if you haven't been using the replenish unit mechanic in this game, it's pretty powerful. <laughs> it's a better deal than I thought it was, and I had just hadn't used it before. It was a little bit of a surprise to me, so it may be kind of uh, a little bit of, of uh, new info for some of you as well. Other guys are like, yeah, I've always known that, Bram. You're just not catching on? <laughs> That's all right, too. Okay, what else is going on here? I think by now the Cherokee mounted rifles are probably ready. Somebody mentioned they probably are. Got to go find them this way. Can't just click on Fort Gibson. Yeah, Stan Wade is ready to go with his Springfield Musketoons. Well, you know what? I could do the same thing with him. Let's see. We've got Jocelyn's Maynards and Merrill's coming. And they're still quite a ways off. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to wait two and a half months. For that and then pop a replenish on top of that that's a little bit too long I'm not gonna do it but um, so we got 1100 guys let's see what our manpower is in yeah we, well we have almost a thousand volunteers but we've got over 2,000 drafts and he's a volunteer, that's a volunteer unit. I can pull drafts into that. And it's still going to remain a volunteer unit. So I'm not going to wait for the carbine. He'll just get carbines when everybody else does in the cab. But let's go ahead and replenish uh, the Cherokee rifles. Eighty. Oh my goodness. I was expecting that to be between 30 and 45 days. Not 87. Can that be turned off? 
It cannot. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. It's another 87 days for uh, Stan Woody. However, by the time he finally comes back and can go to Price's Army, it'll be a much, much larger unit, and by then we'll have some good weapons to give him. So... <laughs> All right. Okay, so a separate but somewhat related matter is weapons procurement. And this is something that I don't think it's been a, a it hasn't been a topic in this series. And I'm not sure we've even got comments on videos in this series, but it is something that I occasionally see crop up in Steam discussions. Where someone will say something along the lines of, when you unlock a weapon, you don't need to order it. That gets you a big batch coming quicker, but if you just leave it alone, they will trickle in. I've seen multiple statements to that effect over time. Not a whole lot, but that idea is out there. I didn't think that was true. I had never seen anything that indicated it was true. But uh, Worms and I did a couple of test campaigns to uh, kind of confirm or debunk that. And yeah, that, that doesn't happen. <laughs> You have to order the weapons, period. Uh, we we set up a we set up a test run where you know we what we did was we, we picked Confederate rifles specifically to ensure that we were looking at weapons that it was impossible for the Union to have. Therefore, we could not get any captured weapons, which would skew the results, right? Like if we had done reboards or Mississippis, that, wouldn't, that would have been less clear because we might capture those from the Union. So we use Confederate rifles, which are the Fayetteville, the Richmond rifle, and the uh, Richmond carbine. And uh, so if, you know, the Union can't produce those. Now they have their own union specific weapons as well. Um, and so we unlocked the project and just let it run and run and run and run. Nope, none ever showed up. And then the question became, well, maybe you have to order some in order to get the standardization up and maybe then they'll start trickling in. Tried that. Nope, that doesn't help either. Got the standardization, you know, got those weapons in or unlocked made some orders and so those came in did not issue them and got the standardization number up let me show this so weapons that you produce domestically have a little standardization number okay this value is a reflection of how fast can they be produced. And as this number goes up, then the length of time that it takes for an order goes down. And so the idea was, well, maybe if standardization comes up a bit, maybe then they start trickling it. No, they don't. The time of delivery does come down, though. The price doesn't. You can't make them cheaper by doing that, which doesn't really make sense. Seems like it would, right? Uh, but the length of time for an order does decrease substantially. And we got uh, Fayettevilles and Richmonds up to, like, 36, which is pretty high. Uh, and, no, they, they, they don't trickle in. So got to order them. And as, even as it is right now, you know, we just, we, we unlocked the Mississippis, we made a big order, and so standardization is starting to come up. 
Um, but I, th I think this number will keep going up and up and up. And the further it goes up, the shorter an order of Mississippis would take. And standardization is up a little bit on these planes rifles. And what's our other one? Reboards? What are we doing on reboards? So standardization is up to nine on these. And that's because we unlocked the reboards earlier than we did the planes in Mississippis. So if I were to do an order right now, that's still pretty long. That nine standardization isn't really doing much for us. Do I want to do any more reboards? I don't think so. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I am not 100% sure that I am going to um, order any more rifles after those uh, Mississippis come in. As it stands right this moment, all of our infantry, except for these Texas brigades down here, all of our infantry have some form of rifle. And we're at 116,000. When I replenish these brigades down here, we're going to jump. And we're probably, you know, over a rel not instantly, but over a relatively short period of time, we're going to jump to probably 140,000. And we're going to have our second core for Kentucky. And I think I'm pretty much going to maintain the status quo. Like that's going to be our military. Um, because I don't want to build an enormous military because that costs money and impacts credit rating and messes with the finances. <clears throat> And so here we are, we're in 1862, and we haven't really moved this needle much, right? We got a slight advantage. What's it? Yeah, slight advantage, but uh, we haven't done much. Neither has the Union. And this is basically. And I'm not going to claim that this has been my idea from the very beginning. This is kind of what has evolved. Price is sitting here at like Lebanon and Rolla and Springfield. And he's just fighting battle after battle after battle. And it's pretty static. So is he actually doing anything? Well, I think the answer to that is yes. He's doing a lot. A. By fighting in Missouri... He's not fighting in Arkansas, right? He's protecting our trans-Mississippi states, which is important because, as I think I've mentioned before, there's lots of stuff over here in Texas that is raw materials, particularly when it comes to agricultural, livestock, crops, that sort of thing. And we're building railroads across here to, to better connect that with the factories that turn that into provisions and just generally feed into the economy, okay? Price being here and, and keeping the fighting in Missouri protects all that. Now, if we were doing something else, would the Union come down in here and mess with all this? That's, that's a different question. Uh, I think they would at least come into Arkansas. I've seen that before. So the idea I have here is that I'm just going to keep Price doing what he's doing. And it's going to be battle after battle after battle. And giving him enough where he can continue to do that effectively. And he's tying up more Union troops over here. Union troops that can't be used in Kentucky or in Virginia or to do something else that we really wouldn't like. As long as he stays here, he's kind of a lightning rod and these three or four Union armies in here are going to keep ping-ponging him and not doing anything else. So by keeping him static, I'm keeping multiple Union armies static 
in keeping the fighting in a region that doesn't really hurt us in the big picture, if that makes any sense. Somewhat similar thing with the near west, the Kentucky Tennessee Theater, in that as long as we keep fighting in Kentucky and potentially southern Indiana, that is fighting that is not happening in Tennessee, which is one of our most important states economically for industry and manpower and all sorts of stuff. The idea that I had about Western Virginia or letting them have West Virginia, that didn't really work <laughs> in that they haven't taken control. So, but by the same token, it's not really causing us any problems either, right? If I were to send an army up in here and to reclaim Grafton and Wheeling and maybe take Marietta, okay, I can do that. But once I do that, that essentially opens up a fourth theater and will it because it's going to draw union attention and there will it, and, and it's just something that I'm going to have to keep putting resources in as well here. As long as I ignore this, I think the union will ignore this. And frankly, that's probably fine. Now one could say, well, that's another area where you can just kind of suck them in and make them do the same thing. And I could, but I think doing it in the Trans-Mississippi and, uh, and in Kentucky is enough. Okay, so then, fine, this goes on forever and ever. What's your plan for winning the war, Bram? At some point... The Army of Northern Virginia is going to start whooping some butt over here. That's my plan for winning the war. <laughs> I could probably do it now, but you know. I want to get my army organization. I want to get Lee in command. I want to set all my little commanders the way that they are. Get all the right guys. Uh, and then we're going to start messing around in Maryland and Pennsylvania. That's, that's my idea. Okay, so this is essentially holding action over here in Missouri and Kentucky. To be honest, I'm not really sure I need that other core in Kentucky. I just feel like that's going to start... I'm going to do it. Johnson may be able to do it himself. Anyway. So that's kind of the broad brush idea. It's not going to unfold this episode. It's not going to unfold probably over the next several. But that's kind of the long term how I see this campaign going. Okay. And true to form, I have been jabbering for a while. Which means I think it's about time to hit play. Before I do that, though, I want to mention, hey, if you're new to this series... If you're new to the channel, and we're in episode 22 here, uh, and if you'd like to catch up on what has been going on in this campaign up till now, um, I'm going to put a little uh, card link up there at the top of the screen to the playlist for this series. And then at the end of the episode, uh, I'll put a link there as well. But if you're with us for the first time, I hope you're enjoying the video which is primarily just consisted of me jabbering on forever with nothing happening. <laughs> it's kind of the way it goes around here. Um, and, and I hope you're interested in watching more of the series in the playlist and as we continue in the future. Okay. Let's get time rolling. Turn that front lines off. I think our battle squadron is just about ready. Ninety-nine Huntsville's at eighty-nine. They're yeah, they're fine. 
Nope. In Harbor for repairs still. It's not disabled, but it's not it's not grayed out, but it's not actually here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but let's let's wait until uh, and, and I did change commanders. I took, uh, I've put Raphael Sems in charge of this battle squadron, and there's a reason for that. Got another little experiment that I want to run. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it this uh, episode or not. Oh, the other thing I've done is, uh, previously I said, hey, I formed these little brig fleets. I initially was going to use them as raiders, but... Uh, Nah, I'm gonna just uh, I'm gonna just use them as uh, blockade fleets. Sort of renamed them. I'm just bringing them way out here to ensure he doesn't run into a federal blockade. Fleet. Oh, what just happened here? I guess we ran into another uh, Union fleet. Okay. All right. Well, this guy is supposed to go up by New York. About like that. And Battle Squadron, get down here and repair your ships, like you said you were doing. <clears throat> yeah, get all, get all your ships. So interestingly, you know, that one ship in harbor for repairs back in X number of days, that, you know, that doesn't make the fleet. Uh, out of action. He still went up there and sailed. And if he went in the battle, he just would have had seven ships instead of eight. So th this is a little bit misleading here. Let's just tell them to actually go into port. Okay, we've got our Diplomacy 1. That's going to increase our Diplo subsidies, which means more levels of trade deals. And I think where I want to go next... I am going to go ahead and unlock Government Funding 2. And now I'm going to start working on these Revenue Acts over here. Anything happening here near Louisville? No. That's remaining static. That's fine. Is anybody coming in on price? No. I'm going to do something different though here. Let's put uh, price in scout mode. Improves intelligence gathering and he does have some calf Marmaduke's calf employed to perform scouting and patrolling I used to use this all the time and I think it's useful and the reason I stopped is because a a core 
or an army in scouting mode has a much, much longer reinforcement time. That's why, and so that's why I stopped using it. But Price is over here by himself. He's not reinforcing anybody <laughs> because there's no one to reinforce. So he can be in scouting mode. Now, whether that really works very well when a army's stationary, I don't know. That may only kick in when they're actually moving. Do I have any units in Price's army that I feel comfortable in re sending on replenishment? I think yes. Let's send Waitman on replenishment. He's right here in Missouri. Let's double check Missouri's manpower. I think they should have plenty. Yeah, there's 12,000 volunteers in Missouri. Zero drafts, though. We can't draft in Missouri because Missouri is not a Confederate state. So, let's go ahead and pop. Just, just go default DV. That's fine. Matter of fact, I probably ought to go and put all Missouri units on this because they can't get giraffes. That's, that may have been part of our manpower problem in this particular army. I didn't think of that before. I'm going to do it. Go ahead and replenish and let's see how long that takes. Okay, 36 days. It's not terrible. Parsons is fine. These are Missouri guys. I need to put them... All these Missouri units, I need to put back... Okay, Louisiana's fine on draft. Arkansas is fine. I don't, I don't want to replenish more than one unit at a time. South Carolina, okay. Mar Maryland. I don't think I can draft from Maryland. I think we got lots of draftees in Texas. We should. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, these guys in Missouri. All right, <clears throat> that's fine. Okay, so Waitman, 936 men. Let's just see how big Waitman is when he comes back in 36 days. I bet he's gonna be full size, like 28, 2,900 men. I don't know that for sure. <laughs> on projects here I'm just kind of looking through that there's a lot of good projects in there but I'm not seeing any that are standing out to me what I'm waiting for in the military side is uh, organization reform so that I can get the army HQs established and I'm gonna do that in all three theaters 
even for Missouri. And then I'm just going to start hitting uh, logistics reform repeatedly and get levels in that. And that will drive down our army upkeep cost and help out the government budget. And I'm attacking it from the other side with the revenue acts. And then we're also attacking it with uh, clearing the blockade, which I probably could have done a little bit faster. I've got ideas for how to do that a little bit faster in the future. Okay, we have built the Houston and Shreveport Railroad. which is now in place here. And that is now this line that runs up here. Huntsville, Palestine, Dallas, and then over to Shreveport. Okay, so now we've got a rail connection from this area of Texas, uh, going straight across Louisiana into the rest of the Confederacy. Next thing we're going to do is the Dallas to Little Rock. And we'll I'm kind of curious to see how that's actually going to, you know, I don't, you know, if it comes over here and then up or if it goes straight up. I don't know. But we're going to build it now. And this is going to take 280 days. I wish at the beginning of the campaign, actually, I could probably go back and look in episode one. I don't remember how many days it took uh, before. I don't remember the exact number, but it sure doesn't look to me like that railroad transport capacity bumped up very much. With the completion of a new railroad. Oh, I bet those Mississippis are done by now. Yes, they are. 51,000 Mississippi rifles. That looks pretty sweet. Let's go to Bragg's Recruiting Command. He's already got Springfield rifles. He's fine. Yes, I know it's more clicks. I prefer doing it this way. You can also, you know, I could select Bragg's Army and just hit this upgrade button. And it would uh, auto upgrade and just put the best available weapons in every unit here. I just don't like doing it that way. <laughs> this doesn't take that much longer. And now, now we are going to furlough or replenish all these guys. How long is that going to take? 58 days? Now see, if they were sitting in Texas, that time would be shorter. Matter of fact, it might, it might have been faster just to transfer them all back to Texas first and then replenish them, but doing it this way now. Okay, 58 days, 77 days, 77 days, 77 days. This is the Arkansas unit. That's why it's shorter. All right. So that's still going to be a little bit, you know, it's still going to take a while. How about these guys? Yeah, let's replenish them too. <laughs> So 
so I think that's a pretty good illustration about having multiple recruiting commands much closer to the states if you're if one were to take this approach. So what is that, about two and a half months, so uh, end of May, beginning of June, something like that, for those guys to be available. And then that's going to be a lot of Texas units. Matter of fact, Texas might wind up being the state with the most troops in the field. So that may, have, may not have been a hot idea after all. <clears throat> I'm sure they'll do well. Especially since they all have Mississippis. <laughs> Get some action here. Somebody's moving. All right, what's shaping up here? Army of the Tennessee with 6,000 men is coming up here to join Army of the West with eight. So 14,000 men to Sidney Johnson's got 23,000. This army is still the same up here. I think there's still an army just sitting here, apparently. Well, you know what? I can do the same thing with Johnston. Let's just put him in scout mode. Maybe he'll get a little bit better. Meanwhile, put him in defensive. going to cross the river. Doesn't know what he wants to do. Well he, he, well, he wanted to get on the river. The gumbo prevented that. <laughs> no, I think he just figured, oh, here's a supply depot over here that needs building. I think he's just going to go over here and do that. Our national morale remains perfectly fine. 96. Okay, well, didn't have my eye on Price, but uh, George Merrill has come back with the Army of Indiana, and this time he's got the Army of the Mississippi with him for a combined 30, well, 34,000 against our 18,000. And what is with this? One brigade with 129 men. What is with that? In the earlier battle where we saw this, what that turned out to be was Johnston had, not Johnston, Price had one artillery battalion on its way that had not arrived yet. And that is the battalion that was showing as low morale last time. However, that was a while back. That's no longer the case, so I don't know what this means. It's probably the same brigade. I just don't know why. Okay. Well, um, it's been going about 45 minutes. I think I'm going to go ahead and cut the episode here, and then 
this uh, next battle is going to be the next episode. Which I will post at around the same time. So that will do for this particular episode. If you like what we're doing with the channel, if you like the content, then leave a like. Leave a comment. I like the comments. Even when you're making fun of me. <laughs> Which happens a lot. Uh, you know, maybe even subscribe. And like I said a little bit earlier in the episode, I'm posting a link to the playlist here if you want to catch up on the previous episodes. But at any rate, at any rate uh, thank you all very, very much for watching. I appreciate it.